This video is about the hop vibration. The narrative will be a bit Nolan-esque, as we're going to discuss how to visualise it first, and then define what it actually mathematically is, and then I'll mention some details as to why we're interested in the hop vibration, beyond how visually pleasing it is. Visually, we're going to look at a correspondence between circles in 3D space and points on the sphere. Our first example is that the unit circle in a plane of zero height in 3D space corresponds to the north pole of the sphere. As a bit of terminology, we call the points on the sphere base points and call the circles in 3D space fibres. Now we're going to turn to animations in order to see what happens as we move the base point from the north to the south pole. So here we've got the sphere and base point in the top left and 3D space and the fibre in the centre. As a warning, a lot of information is about to be thrown at you, and it won't be justified. It's really more about getting intuition for how to navigate around this correspondence. So strap in. As we rotate the base point to the bottom, we see the corresponding circles in 3D space, which are increasing in radius. Each circle encircles the z-axis, but something interesting happens when the base point actually hits the south pole. The circle has become the z-axis, but this isn't a circle, so I've lied to you. However, I'm not going to come clean about exactly how I've lied yet. For that, you'll have to wait for the maths. For now, see this as the exception. The only point on the sphere which doesn't correspond to a circle is the south pole, which instead corresponds to a line. Now let's look at a point on the equator. For such points, rotating around the z-axis on the sphere in fact simply corresponds to rotating the circle around the z-axis in 3D space. And something nice happens when we plot the set of fibres for the whole equator. It carves out a bagel, or in technical language, a torus. We can move the equator up to another circle of constant height. In 3D space, this corresponds with a different torus. And this red torus is completely contained in the purple one. Conversely, if we move the circle lower, we get a torus which completely contains the ones that we've just looked at. And so we get a remarkable structure on 3D space of nested tori coming from different heights on the sphere. These tori, together with the circle corresponding to the north pole and the line corresponding to the south pole, fill out all of 3D space. We can learn more about how these tori fit together by slicing some bagels. There will then be a corresponding way to slice up the system of tori. We'll gain insight through three different slices. Our first is across a plane with height zero. How does this cut the tori? The z-axis goes through the whole of the bagel, so the cut at height zero is just the standard bagel cut. So here I am, struggling to cut through a pumpkin spice bagel. If we do this, in the cutting plane we get two concentric circles. So now what happens if we slice the whole system of nested tori? If you want, pause to picture this. When we slice the nested tori, we get a bunch of concentric circles, and a point in the center which corresponds to cutting the z-axis. This was not surprising, but also doesn't tell us much about the system of tori. If we just see the concentric circles, we don't know which ones correspond to which torus. To get more insight, we move on to the next cut, the vertical cut, which corresponds to a cut in the plane x equals zero although there are many equivalent choices of vertical cuts that we could take. In the cutting plane, we roughly have two circles, but now they're identical, with a line of symmetry between them. Again, think about what happens when we slice the whole system of tori this way, pausing if you need. The picture should look something like this. A system of nested circles on either side of the z-axis, a 
along with points at x equals plus or minus 1. In my previous video, we saw assistant circles just like this, coming from the projection of rotation orbits. This system of circles is known as the circles of Apollonius, and in fact, these circles are exactly what we get from this cut. In fact, this cut was much more instructive than the first bagel cut. We can now exactly characterize this system of tori. They are the surfaces of revolution of the circles of Apollonius. They're sort of tori of Apollonius. Okay, so we've identified the tori that are carved out by rotating the circles, but we still need to identify the circles or the fibers themselves. And these are given by our third and final cut, which is the most complicated. If we return to the resulting half bagel from the vertical cut, in the cutting plane, there are two circles. In this plane, there's two lines which both pass through the origin and are tangent to both circles. Pick one of them. We can then use this to define a plane in three dimensions by picking the plane whose normal is perpendicular to this line and also lies in this vertical cutting plane. Equivalently, this plane comes from extending the tangent line parallelly into the x direction. This cut intersects the half torus in a nice crescent moon shape, and adding back the other half torus gives two circles. We can make a choice of one of these circles, and this is precisely the type of circle which appears in the hop vibration. By rotating this round the z-axis, we construct the torus as we did originally. These circles are special, and are called Villaso circles. We can do this in real life too, by doing this so-called Villaso cut. Here I attempt to do one, unsuccessfully. While I try to do this, let me tell you something else which is interesting about these circles. On a torus, there's in some sense two types of holes. One is encircled by the kind of circles we get by doing a vertical cut, and the other is encircled by the kind of circles we get from a bagel cut. But Villaso circles, in fact, encircle both of these holes. Anyway, here's one I made earlier, which is definitely not the one from before because I ran out of bagels. But from these three cuts, we now have a complete visual characterization of the fibers, although it's a bit of a mouthful. They are villaso circles on the tori of Apollonius, with two degenerate tori at the poles of the sphere. Hopefully you agree that this is a very pretty structure on 3D space, but it's time to come clean. Here's the twist, it's not really supposed to be a structure on 3D space. It's actually a structure on the 3 sphere, which is the analog of the sphere, or the two sphere, but in 4D space. Sadly, the visual intuition we've been building all of our lives doesn't equip us very well for visualizing 4D space. But we can, in a sense, visualize most of the three sphere using stereographic projection. Remember that for a regular sphere, stereographic projection maps the sphere missing the North Pole onto the plane. For the 3 sphere, stereographic projection misses the 4D analogue of the North Pole, but otherwise maps the rest of it onto all of 3D space. This resolves the earlier problem of the fibre of the South Pole being a line instead of a circle. If we look at the 2D analogue, the line on the plane comes from stereographic projection of a circle on the sphere. So in the original case, the Z axis really is a circle on the 3 sphere. The 3 sphere is described algebraically by 4D vectors with magnitude 1. That is, the sum of the square of each component is 1. Any 4D vector can be thought of as a 2D complex vector, also with magnitude 1, in the sense that the sum of the squared magnitudes of each component is 1. If you need to, take a second to check this. The structure of the hop vibration can then be distilled into a function called the hop map. 
we'll only discuss a light version, which takes in these 2D complex vectors and projectivizes them. Roughly, this means it returns the ratio of the two components of the complex vector. Every complex number can be attained by doing this to a complex vector on the 3 sphere, and you should check this. But also, z0 can take the value 0, and in this case the ratio takes the value infinity. Therefore, the image of the 3 sphere under the Hopf map is the complex plane together with infinity, which is precisely the Riemann sphere. So this Hopf map is a map from the 3 sphere to the 2 sphere. Now consider the different complex vectors that give the same ratio. By multiplying the complex vector by a complex number, we get a new vector, but the ratio is unchanged. If we multiply by a phase, that ensures the complex vector stays on the 3 sphere. Since different complex phases form a circle, then on the 3 sphere we get a circle's worth of points which all map onto the same point of the Riemann sphere. Therefore, we get a mathematical characterization of the fibers. If we take a base point on the Riemann sphere, then the corresponding fiber is the preimage of the base point under this Hopf map. So why would you care about the Hopf vibration beyond its visual beauty? I'll keep it brief, but there are good reasons to care as a mathematician or physicist. For me, it's an important example of a principal bundle or G bundle where the G stands for group. And this is a structure that forms the geometric backdrop for gauge theory. For example, we can visualize gauge transformations or transition functions to a geometer in the Hopf vibration context. If we take the open disk in 3D space, it intersects each of the fibers except for the north pole fiber exactly once. This defines what's called a section on the sphere minus the north pole. But in fact, there are many possible choices of section on this open set made up of the sphere minus the North Pole. To obtain a new section, I can rotate each point along its own fiber. The transformation that sends one section to the other is a gauge transformation. This transformation rotated each fiber by the same amount, but we could also rotate each point by an amount which depends on its original position. The position-dependent transformation is known as a local gauge transformation. I might come back to visualizing important concepts in gauge theory in a later video. From a group theory perspective, this also forms an example of the orbit stabilizer theorem in a geometric setting. And there are furthermore many examples where the hop vibration crops up in physics, including with magnetic monopoles. I should mention that there's loads of other online content on the hop vibration. The Wikipedia page is great, and there's another video on this very site by Niles Johnson which is very good. And it's even been discussed on the Joe Rogan experience, which is wild, and this image is taken from Second Life. Uh, the metaverse could never. Also, while video is the only way to convey the visual side, it's not really the right medium to convey the maths, and that wasn't really the purpose of the video. To that end, I've also linked some notes to flesh out the details which are missed out, in case you wanted more. Well, hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, subscribe or leave a like or comment, it's always greatly appreciated. And see you next time.